Today, if someone is interested in finding about, out about the natural world, about scientific subjects, there's lots of different ways to access information and different theories. One can go to the internet, of course, turn on the television, go to a magazine, read a textbook. In antiquity as well, there were lots of different forms of communication about the ancient world. In fact, when we look at ancient texts that survive in Greek and Latin about the natural world, we might be surprised at the variety and the richness of the sorts of texts that were there. For example, poetry in antiquity was a very powerful mode of communicating about the natural world. Some of the most important texts and most popular texts that survive from antiquity about the natural world were actually poems. When I talk about popularity, in the case, for instance, of Herodotus' poem on astronomical phenomena, we know that he wrote it in ancient Greek, and it was translated in antiquity many times into Latin by different translators. We also know that some of those Latin translators updated it, updated his poem with new astronomical information. One of the things that's very interesting about Herodotus' poem is that the information, the astronomical information that he includes and reports in his poem is actually based on an earlier prose work by someone called Eudoxus. Eudoxus's prose work no longer survives, but Herodotus' poem does. What does that tell us about ancient scientific authors and also their audiences? Clearly the information that Eudoxus had was considered interesting and significant enough for Herodotus to translate it into a poetic form. And as I explained a moment ago, it was also translated many times into Latin. And that the poem was so such a nice vehicle for containing this information, so something that was so much valued, I think is for us today somewhat counterintuitive because we would not expect a scientist to publish its work in a poem today. Another example, which is related to that, is Lucretius's poem on the nature of the universe, on the, on the nature of things. He was an author writing in Latin, and I think that we can understand that he adopted, adapted, and translated the ideas of Epicurus, natural philosopher writing about the world. He wrote in Greek. His long prose work on nature doesn't survive, but Lucretius's poem does survive. And in fact, Lucretius tells us a couple of times in his poem that what is important about his poem, one of the things that's important, is that it's offering something like a honeyed cup that we can drink information from. Just as if a parent wants a child to take some medicine, they'll put a bit of honey around the rim of the cup before offering it to the child. So Lucretius is offering us Epicurus's ideas in the honeyed cup of poetry. Of course, not all ancient works about nature and mathematics were written in poetry form, and, but it might be surprising to know that some very interesting and challenging poems were about mathematical problems. So for example, there's the very famous problem that's called the cattle problem, and it's actually attributed to the mathematician Archimedes. It's also interesting because it was addressed to another ancient figure, a scholar known as Eratosthenes, who was the librarian at Alexandria. Eratosthenes was known in antiquity for his range of interests. He wrote, for instance, on Homer's poems. He was also interested in various mathematical topics. And we know from the beginning of the cattle problem that Archimedes has addressed this to Eratosthenes. One can understand that this would have been sent in a letter to him and that it would have been sent across the sea from Syracuse to Alexandria. We have a number of letters that survive from antiquity, another important form of communication. We have a number of letters that survive that were apparently transmitted and sent between different mathematicians in antiquity or people very interested in mathematics. So people would 
be sending each other problems, in some cases solved, in other cases not. Letters were also used by other people who were interested in the natural world and in mathematics and antiquity. I've already mentioned Epicurus, some of whose ideas were transmitted by Lucretius. Three of Epicurus's letters survive. They were collected by a much later author, Diogenes Laertius, and he includes these letters in his biography of Epicurus. And one of the letters in particular that survives, Epicurus explains in that letter that he's written it so that his followers will have a very easy form, an easy short form to pull out a, when they wish to consult a text on his ideas without having to read a long account of his ideas. It's a sort of aid memoir, something just to refresh the memory about his important ideas. There are many other sorts of types of texts that survive from antiquity about mathematical topics and scientific topics. One, for instance, is the biography that I've already mentioned. It's not entirely clear whether or not it was a entirely separate genre in antiquity, but there were many different accounts of lives that were written about ancient philosophers and mathematicians. We have, for example, several accounts of the life of Pythagoras that survive from antiquity. One we find in Diogenes Laertius, who I've already mentioned. Another one survives in a later, in another author called Porphyry, and in his student, Iamblichus. And it's very interesting because when we look at these accounts of Pythagoras' life, we see that in the account, particularly of, by Iamblichus, he shares some characteristics with Jesus. So for instance, both are sons of God and both are the progeny of a virgin. And we can immediately see that there are certain parallels between Iamblichus's life of Pythagoras and the Christian Gospels. And when we consider the period in which this was written, we can perhaps imagine that Iamblichus may have been giving us his account of P Pythagoras as a very important intellectual and religious figure who may actually have been somewhat in competition in certain circles for followers in that historical period. And we know, even from looking at the writings of later authors, for instance, Galileo and Kepler, they communicated with each other by letters, and they said that they were brothers in Pythagoreanism. So we, we see, again, the importance of letters being a form of communication there, but also biography as conveying very important ideas about who these people were and how they figure in the culture of their period. We have various accounts of, from different ancient authors telling us about how people they knew dealt with specialists who were promulgating different technical ideas. So we have Eratosthenes, the playwright making fun of people talking about clouds in his play, The Clouds. We have a much later author, Plutarch, in his dialogue on the face on the moon, giving us a very detailed account of a group of men who are conversing together, going for a walk together, talking about what is the nature of the moon, what is the face on it, how do we know about it? They ask questions, how do we gain knowledge about the moon and about distant objects? as well. And so we get some sense that people in general, those who were educated of, you know, we, a certain level of education being presumed here, people going to the theater, people who would have heard different performances of different texts being read out, that these were the sorts of things that people thought about. In fact, in Plutarch's dialogue that I've just mentioned, the narrator says, this is a question, what is the face on the moon? This is a question that is on everyone's lips. So it gives us an idea that these are the sorts of questions that people 
in antiquity would have wondered about, just as many people do today. In addition to written texts, we also have some evidence from archaeological remains and also some artworks that show us an indication of how the natural world was depicted, for instance, in art. And also, we have some idea of some scientific instruments. So for instance, Aristotle talks about the wind being portrayed on different vases. And when we look at some Greek vases, we can see that certain gods are represented as winds. There are also some inscriptions that survive, stone inscriptions, that also would have served as instruments. And I'm thinking here particularly of the inscriptions that we call parapegmata. Well, they're a stone inscription that have holes drilled in them that are a form of calendar that correlate astronomical phenomena with weather events. And there were holes in the stone in which you would have placed and moved a wooden peg to count out different days. And several fragments of these survive and actually are in a museum in Berlin. We also have many, many sundials that survive from antiquity. Some of these were probably purely decorative and would not have been inscribed accurately and would have been a sort of garden ornament, for instance, for a villa in Pompeii. But others were much more sophisticated and would have been used as a form of calendar as well as being used to tell what time of day it was. One of the challenges and frustrations in terms of studying ancient texts about the natural world is that in some cases, what we have is only fragmentary. So for instance, Plutarch's dialogue on the face on the moon is missing the beginning part, and we don't know what the beginning said. I've mentioned already the fragments of the pre-Socratics. It would be wonderful to have those complete texts. In some cases, and I think, for instance, here of Aristotle, what we have seems to have been not his original words in some cases. And so the text can seem a little bit garbled and hard to understand. And we might wish to have a better, more direct version of it. So I think that that's one of the challenges and almost hopes that we have in terms of studying ancient science. Hope springs eternal. And we hope that we might get a better version or find a fragment. And of course, these things do happen from time to time. And it's very exciting when they do.